We'll get going. So thank you all for being here today for our now sixth alumni career conversation. Um, thank you, Allison Kessler and Liz Holloway for helping to put all these together. And of course, all that have been participating in this. Um, so today we have Molly Fisher here speaking with us. We're, we have the pleasure of having her go over a variety of different topics, but discussing kind of her career path and some some advice along the way. Uh, but just to briefly go over, Molly is a um, Whitman graduate from 2008 from uh, majoring in accounting and finance, again in 2012 with a master's in accounting. And then if I'm correct, it's 2015 from the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania, which is awesome with her MBA from there. Um, but Molly started her career at Goldman Sachs. She, she did an internship there and was hired on for about her first five years of her career. Transitioned to HelloFresh, where you held multiple roles there, and just as of last year with Dig In as the Chief of Staff to the CFO. Um, so looking forward to hearing about this whole transition and progress that you've taken over the years. So um, go ahead, Molly, you can take it over and we'll start now. Great. Um, so welcome, everybody. I had put the slide together, which was an intro to myself, but at least all my thunder. Um, and I know a lot of you have either heard me speak at events in New York City or have already scoped out my LinkedIn. My LinkedIn has been blowing up over the past week, which is good. Um, but here's just a little overview of who I am and where I've been. I, the whole point of the presentation is to kind of talk about how I made all of these decisions, mainly the top on my employers rather than education. I can tell you why I got my master's account for women, but you guys are all women students, you know how great the place is, uh, and ditto, or just as equally as excited. But I can get into that if we want. Um, so that's an intro to me. So a little bit of recap about my time at Q. So I was there from 2004 to 2008, which feels like forever ago. Uh, I majored in finance and accounting. I minored in econ. I minored in math. I have that little asterisk because my last semester, senior year, I actually had to drop that minor. It was the hardest class I've ever been in, um, graduate level statistics. So I'm like, call it nine tenths of the way to a minor. So I put it with the asterisks because I put up with all those other classes. Uh, my activities while I was at CUSE, I was in Beta Alpha Psi. I was on the exec committee my senior year. I studied abroad in London spring semester my junior year. Uh, my GPA was over 3.8, so I was summa cum laude. And my overall goal, you'll notice my activities compared to maybe some of the other speakers are a little bit light. Uh, that's because I was just a student. I wanted to be a student. I wanted to take as many courses as I could and really focus on my in-classroom learning experience. I knew networking would come later in life. We'll get to that. Um, but that's really like how, if someone says, how did you spend your time in Syracuse? I spent it in a team room in Whitman, um, which I enjoyed. Hopefully you guys all study as well, but that's who I am in a nutshell of my time at Q's. Um, so I wanna quickly pause. I wanna know who I'm chatting with so I can kind of um, steer any specifics about my trajectory to everybody on the call. So I think I know all the faculty on, but it would be great to hear from your student, from the student's name, year you are, major if you've already declared, and then internship, which I know is a touchy subject given what's going on, but um, what internships you have. Just I don't know how I'll do that in an order, so. Well, uh, to facilitate, we can do yeah. Allie, Amanda, Caroline, and um, Valerie, if we can go in that order, just in the list. So Allie, why don't you go first? My name is Allie, and I'll be a junior next year. Um, I'm majoring in accounting, and I don't have an internship this year. No worries. <laughs> Amanda? Hi, um, my name's Amanda Berman. I just actually graduated in May. Um, I majored in marketing and finance. And I mean, as of now, I guess I'm just really looking for a real job. But if an internship comes my way, I would take that too. Cool. 
Um, hi, I'm Caroline Kelly. I'm going into my junior year. Um, I'm a finance and supply chain major with a minor in German, and my internship actually got canceled this year, so I'm trying to look for anything. Where was your internship supposed to be? I was supposed to be in Munich, Germany. Hmm. Cool. I think I'm the last one. Yes. <laughs> Hi, my name is Valerie and I'm a first, well, not the first year, I'm a second year graduate student at Syracuse University studying business analytics. Uh, my undergrad major was uh, information management technology and economics, still at Syracuse. Uh, so my internship, my current internship, I'm working for a company called Brainkey. It's a healthcare company that has a artificial intelligence core uh, in San Francisco, but currently a main Syracuse. So it's a uh, remote because, you know, everything's happening. Yeah, that's where we're at. Great. Uh, a very diverse set of backgrounds and years. It's exciting. Um, great. So we had this, I have this next section called taking your skill set across multiple industries. Really, I personally call it like choose your own adventure. That's how I've defined my career thus far. Um, and what I really want to talk to you guys, each decision I've made, how I arrived at that. Um, so we'll dive right in. So how did I choose a career path? Big secret. I didn't. I don't know what I want to be when I grow, grow up. I've never known what I wanted to be when I grow up. And it's actually a joke that I have with all of my mentors and my exec coach is I'm in my mid thirties, unfortunately. Um, and I just don't know. So I make it up as I go along. I figure out what I like, what I don't like, what I'm good at, what I'm not good at. Uh, usually what I'm not good at and what I don't like doing are one and the same, but sometimes they're not. Uh, and so here on the right side, I've listed all the jobs I've wanted to be when I grew up. When I was a kid, I wanted to be someone who checks you out of the grocery store. I thought it was cool that they got to count money all day. Uh, right once I got to Syracuse, I decided I wanted to be an actuary, again, playing with numbers all day, and I heard they made good money. I don't actually know an actuary, um, never became one, thought I wanted to be an accountant, never technically was an accountant by trade, thought I wanted to do it, be an investment banker, that didn't pan out either, uh, and then news anchor, which is Funny, I actually, one of the reasons that I chose Syracuse was because I was enrolled in Newhouse as a freshman after my very first semester, I think it's like Calm 101, I don't even know the name of it. Uh, I realized that I liked my women classes way better than I liked my Newhouse courses. So I probably became one of the only people that's ever actually dropped out of Newhouse. Uh, but I thought that was funny to add in because there's clear grouping on the top four. It's like money numbers, why I wanted to be a news anchor. I have no idea. Um, but so, so that's it, right? You're, you guys are young still. You probably think, right, women, there's, I don't know, seven-ish majors. There aren't just seven careers out there. There's so many. So it's figuring out what you like about each of your classes and each of your majors uh, and applying that to the skill set um, and to the role. So when I first graduated, from Whitman, I got a job at Goldman. I ended up interning there in 07. Uh, that was back when they were recruiting kind of on campus. I don't, I assume they don't do that anymore. Um, it was 07, it was their best earnings year. Uh, so they just had a huge analyst class. So I was there from 2008 to 2013. Uh, my titles ranged from analyst and then I, I was promoted up to associate. I think I was a senior associate by the end. Uh, my department was financial reporting. So at a big bank, you have the sales and trading desk, you have the bankers, but then you have the people who are kind of back office functions. That's where I was sitting. Uh, and what did I do every day? My team calculated the daily P&L. We put together management decks. We did parts of the earnings release. Uh, I was really a holistic view of where the company was and where we thought the company was going. Very interesting work to be doing in 2008 when we were going anywhere and we were deep in the red. Uh, and then watching the whole financial cycle by 2011, I think also became a record year for them. So it's a great place to be. Um, so what did I like about that role? I liked exposure to senior leaders. 
Uh, my team was called management reporting. So I did have the ability to email the CEO. Not that he ever responded, but I would send him emails and decks. I had a lot of hands-on experience with the partner that I worked for and the chief accounting officer. Uh, they were people that were very established in their careers uh, and just great to learn from. It was also just exciting having them know my name. Um, not that that's gonna get me anywhere, but you know, a, a little bit of excitement when you're young. Uh, what I liked, I learned that I like attention to detail. This is one of those things that people say you have to have to be successful in certain roles. Nobody ever says that this is like something you could like, uh, but I do like it. I, lo I like looking at an Excel file and figuring out what's wrong with it, looking at a PowerPoint deck and really making sure it's perfect. Um, so maybe it makes me a nerd, maybe not, but I liked it. Uh, and then I like the brand name recognition. This sounds douchey, but I mean, it was Goldman. It was a little bit better probably back in the day before 08. Uh, but I liked, I realized tonight that I liked working at a company that people knew the name of. Um, what I didn't like, there's a lot. I limited it to three. I didn't like the repetitive work streams, right? So in a reporting function, you have the same weekly and monthly and quarterly responsibilities. For me, that was fun for the first couple of years, but then by the third year, I was like, oh, all right. Like, I know what I have to do. This isn't that exciting. Um, what I didn't like, the lack of creativity Goldman has been around, we'll call it 150 years. The firm knows what works and what doesn't, right? You could have an idea, maybe a great idea, and not to knock any of the senior people, but that they just weren't open to creativity. Uh, and similarly, define roles and responsibilities. I was on an analyst class, I think maybe 300 analysts. My role was you do these 10 things and that's your job. Maybe you get like a bonus 11 thing, but that's really it. Don't do anything else. Cause like that's that other analyst's role. And I didn't like that. I didn't, I was like, well, I'm great at this. Give me more. Um, and that's just not how those big companies work. So overall Goldman, as with any big company, what you like and what you learn there is great. Uh, but for me, it just wasn't where I saw myself long-term. I didn't want to become the partner I worked for. That didn't seem like it would be rewarding to me. However, it was great. I got the big name on my resume, which I am fully supportive of people initially going and getting those big names on your resume. Uh, so then I went to business school. I went to Warren for two years. I didn't put a slide on it. Um, you guys know what it's like to be a student. It's kind of the same, except you're five years older than you are now. Um, so then when I graduated Warren, I graduated Warren in 2015. Uh, 2015 was the time in the economy that there were a lot of subscription boxes. So it was Stitch Fix, Blue Apron, Birchbox, Sparkbox, all of the boxes. Uh, and that's really where I wanted to be. So I found my way to HelloFresh. I'm not a foodie by trade, but you don't need to be to work in the food industry. And I joined what's called the special operations team. Uh, so that's a role that they just put smart people who can do stuff and can do a range of things. Um, so basically like internal consulting, internal execution is what we called it. Um, although I was on this project-based team, I actually ended up running the procurement department. Uh, which means I managed four people who actually bought the food that ends up in the boxes, the HelloFresh boxes. Um, I did not do the other two bullets. That's a mistake on my slide. I did not calculate their bill or their monthly management. I ran the procurement team. Um, what I liked about this role, I liked managing people. This was my first time managing people. I went from managing zero to four, which was scary but exciting. I liked fire drills. So it, and you're, if you're in an operation space or a supply chain type role, you're always on call and you always have something to fix. There was always a truck that was late, a vendor I needed to go yell at. Um, and I found that very exciting. Always on call, it, it's the opposite maybe of work-life balance, but for us overachievers in the group, I liked it. I liked going home and after dinner, maybe needing to log on or on the weekends when I wasn't that busy, didn't have that much of a social life. Having like work, felt like someone needed me. It was exciting. Um, what I didn't like, again, this repetitive work streams thing, that's gonna be a theme. 
every week was the same. It's a weekly subscription box. So we finish one week, we start the next thing, and it looks like the same all over again. Um, I didn't like price negotiation. That's just like not, people have that skill. They're sales folks, and then people don't. And I, I surely am not someone who, who can just like continuously beat up somebody who's also someone who I continuously work with. Um, and then managing a P&L, that a lot of people in their careers like doing that. I like being in a role where I tell people what to do, but I don't need to go and do the thing. Um, it, again, it's different, people like different things, but that's just how I, um, what I liked and didn't like about that role. I was in that role for a year at HelloFresh. The what I didn't like was, equal to what I like. So I was starting to think about what came next for me, either at, was it internal at HelloFresh or externally? Um, so at that point, my boss kind of knew I was in this like, I don't know, plateau, maybe we call it. Uh, so the opportunity to switch over, switch teams and run the finance team was presented. Uh, and at that point, right, I had my HelloFresh experience. I had my Goldman experience. I'm like, no, I don't want to do that finance thing. I did that at Goldman, and that's not for me. And this is why I know it's not for me. Um, so that was my initial gut reaction when I was offered the job. I ended up talking it over with my boyfriend, and he gave me probably one of the best pieces of career advice I've received. And his, his advice was, I'm going to paraphrase him, so you're telling me the CEO, the CFO, and the COO all think this is a job for you? And I say, yep, that's right. And he goes, don't you think those are some pretty smart people? Uh, don't you think you should trust that they know you and your skill set better than you know you and your skill set? Um, so he won and I took the job. It's great advice. If you're ever presented with an opportunity in your career from a senior person, um, think there's probably something they see that you're missing or do it and maybe it fails, but you still listen to a senior person and that's always gonna help your career as well. Uh, so that was my first time at HelloFresh. Uh, and then we'll call it part two. Uh, so I, ran, I moved over to the finance team. Role was a little bit like what I was doing at Goldman, but for a company that had a tangible product. Um, so that's what I liked. I liked that I could be a HelloFresh customer. I was, I ate it every week. Food is fun, right? It's not as fun as stocks. Um, so that's why I, I f figured it was right company, wrong role for me when I was in the operations team. When I moved over, I was managing a team of six. I, over the two and a half years I was in that role, I built out the team to be 23 people. Um, talking to my peers at the time, they all were maybe managing one to two people. I was managing, they were like people who work for people who work for me, uh, which is pretty crazy. I don't even think I was like 30 at the time. Maybe I was exactly 30. So it was a very big shoes for a person who didn't really feel like they like deserve those shoes, but it was great. Uh, my roles, I was running the accounting team, closing the books, doing real time KPI reporting, which is what we call an FP&A function. Uh, what I liked about that role, I liked managing more people. I liked growing and mentoring of those 23 people. Some were very, very junior, fresh out of undergrad, and some were basically my peers, but just in a more junior role. Uh, and I liked having that range of people as a manager that allowed me to flex um, skill sets, working with those different types of people. I liked working with numbers. I liked problem solving. I liked having this holistic view of the business. Uh, so versus when I was in the operations world, I only kind of saw what was going on with my team. I didn't see what marketing was doing. I didn't see one of the other teams, what the product team, what our new recipes were like. But here I had to, because I had to set those KPIs. Uh, and then this is funny to say now, but I liked the flexibility of working from home uh, in that role. Although I was still at the same company, that role just gave me some flexibility to work from home. Uh, and that was before COVID. Now, obviously, we're all working from home. 
Uh, and what I didn't like, right, so that's a long list. Those are the most things that I've liked since I started talking. The one thing I didn't like was executing an existing playbook. So when I had this team of six, we were creating processes. How do we close our month more efficiently? How do we get make sure the numbers are right? Um, we solved those problems. And then I was just doing the processes that myself and my team had created. And that was kind of when I knew it was time to go because I was back, it felt like I was back at Goldman where every week and every month looked the same. I'm gonna pause there because I want this to be interactive. Are there any questions? Cool. Uh, and then here's my last. So learnings from Dig In. If you've been in New York City, we've now renamed ourselves Dig. So Dig, Dig In, I use them interchangeably. Uh, my title is Chief of Staff to the CFO, which we'll get to why it's that. Uh, my responsibilities, I run the corporate strategy and analytics team. I run the guest experience team. So if you eat at one of our restaurants and you write into contact at DIG, I run the team who will respond back. And I just, I hold the analytical role. So any sort of analyses, any project that anybody is doing that, that has some sort of numbers behind it, I have to do either do the numbers or sign off on the numbers that the other team did. Um, what I like about this role, it's a lot of diverse set of problems. Every, basically any problem a company could have has some sort of analytical lens. So I'm always getting lots of projects. Uh, I have an impact on a growing business, which is very exciting. And I work at a company that has a mission. So if you go to Dig and Woods website, we're trying to help farmer. It's like a farm to table-ish concept. And we work with diverse small farmers. We're trying to change the world through vegetables. So obviously regular fast food has its own problems, but the majority of our meals are vegetable forward with a protein uh, because of the environmental impacts that protein has on the world. What I don't like, nothing yet. I've been here a year. It's still very fun. Uh, so at some point I will add what I don't like and that's what I'll evaluate when it's time to move on. Um, but I wanna stop here because I think there's a, another good lesson learned. So the title chief of staff to the CFO, there is probably nobody else in the world that has that very specific title. Chiefs of staff are not normally given to CFOs, normally it's a role. You either work for a CEO or you work for the organization as a whole. Um, but, so taking a step back to when I was at HelloFresh, when I was running the finance team, I reported into the CFO. He and the CFO for the US business, he ended up leaving to become the CFO for Dig In. Him and I got along great. Uh, the day he told me that he was leaving, my first response was, and you're taking me, right? Uh, legally, he cannot just take me with him. There's like laws against that. Uh, but he said, yes, I'll take you what I can take you. Uh, just sit and hold tight. Uh, so we stayed in contact and I joined. He gave me a job offer basically 12 months to the day that he left, which is the legal um, part of our contract that he couldn't poach me until 12 months. Um, so that I think is a big lesson from my career. Once you find somebody that you really enjoy working for, like it's fine to follow them. I joke that he will be, he's my forever boss. Um, I would love to work the next 40 years and always work for him. We get along very well. We have complementary skill sets. Um, and so he created this role for me, right? She was, he, we got together for coffee right at that 12 month mark. And he's like, I can't figure out. I want to come bring you over, but like, we don't really have a role for you. You said you didn't want to do the operations thing. I already have someone running the accounting team and that's not really your skill set either. And he, he kind of said, he's like, what do you think about being my chief of staff? Um, and I said to him, that's my dream job, 100% yes. Um, another thing to know, don't ever take a job on the spot. I lost all negotiation. <laughs> He knew I was going to take it no matter what he offered me for salary or benefits. So 
who over my mistakes and don't do that, you know, think on it and then negotiate. Um, but that's how I have this title. Um, and like, what does it mean? He really throws, being his chief of staff, the chief of staff is a very broad title. At some organizations, it could just be an executive assistant. You could just be getting like coffee and opening doors. Obviously, like, that's not what I would ever want in my career, knowing my background. Um, but I go to any meeting I want that he goes to. I get to go to the board meetings. I was just on a negotiation with a contract, being the analytical lens, because the CFO kind of make it. I don't know what he was doing, but he threw me at it. Um, so it's being able to learn if I want to become a CFO, right? Either I'm his chief of staff in the next 40 years, or I leave here and I gain the skill set to go be a CFO at another company. Um, that's a, a lot. That's my career. So this is my choose your own adventure, right? Each time what I like, what I don't like, and continue up the path. Um, putting things in the what I don't like bucket doesn't mean that would completely mean I wouldn't do it again, right? I joined a finance team even though I had left Goldman. I did the reporting thing even though I like had put that in the don't like bucket. Um, but make sure you're understanding why you're willing to do that project again. And it must be because there's other stuff in that what I like bucket. So that's how I landed on this choose your own adventure. I am now in the restaurant food space and I've been here for two, two jobs now. I wouldn't even say that that's something I like. That's something that is exciting now that I'm here, but I would never, when I was at Whitman, I would have never thought that that's where I would have landed. Um, so be willing to like test out new industries and see what's out there. I'll pause again before we go to the next section if there's any questions on either what I do, how I made my decisions. Um, I have a question, Molly. Sure. Um, so I think it's interesting that it sounded like you started off being more set in the financial ways, um, thinking that that was the route you were going to take. And so I appreciate your honesty about how you transitioned. But enable the transition, I would guess that there's a, a risk component. So um, uh, how would you define your understanding of risk that allowed you to make the changes that you made? Ooh, that's a good one. Um, so risk could be two things. Risk could either be financial risk, uh, and risk could be just pure happiness. Am I good at this job? Um, so I'll talk about both, but one thing I want to know, want to point out is it, I view it only as a risk if there's not a way out. When I left Goldman, I left on great terms. I could still, if they're hiring, I'm confident I could still call up my old boss and say, hey, I'm ready. I'm ready to come back. Like, when do I start? Uh, so that is a, a big learning I mean, it's just called being a good person, but never leave a job on a bad note. You'll never know when you'll need that safety net, right? Hopefully all of my old jobs that I've had, I could always go back to, and that's how you should leave your jobs. Um, on the risk itself, so one, I've thought through my trade-offs. Uh, so working in the restaurant food space, I, I make less than I would be making if I were at Goldman, like, point blank, I maybe like a half of what I would be making. Um, but that comes with trades that I'm willing to take, right? So right now I'm sitting, I'm talking to you guys, I'm wearing leggings, sneakers, and a t-shirt. I would be wearing this even if I was in my office today. I would never have stepped into the Goldman building, not in a suit that had been dry cleaned with a pair of heels, um, with my like nails done. So that's my trade-off is I like the flexibility, the comfort, uh, just being able to be maybe authentic would be the word uh, versus the financial trade-offs. I was very lucky. I did not graduate uh, Whitman with student loans. I think that might've impacted some of my decisions had 
I had that financial burden. Uh, so I just want to recognize to my parents that I was thankful for that. Um, and on the risk, yes, like when I joined HelloFresh, it, it was risky doing that operations job. And my first day running this procurement team, my boss said like, this is the team that runs the produce department. This is the team that runs the protein department. And I went home and I said to my family, what's produce? Um, right. I, we just, I get it now. I like cook now, but back then I, I was like, Oh, the veggie department. Why don't we just call it the veggie department? Um, so it's like having humility to know, I would have never actually have asked my boss that, but knowing that you're just going to have to ask external resources to be successful in a job. Uh, and I also relied on my peers more in that operations role. So there were people who worked for me who knew way, way more about what they were doing than I did. Uh, and I was pretty upfront with my team. Like I can do a lot of things for you as your manager. I have the CEO and the CFO's ear. I had this like war in background. If you want connections, and war and women background, if you want connections, like I can help you. I can't help you with a negotiation with a vendor. Like I can be on it because I have this like title, but like you just, you have to do it. You're better at this than I am. Um, so it's knowing what you bring to the table and what your team brings to the table uh, and being able to, to show some humility in those situations. Thank you. No problem. I was going to add on to that, Molly, to, about your transition that you had. Um, was there anything you did to prepare yourself from going from that corporate environment to that kind of startup, like completely opposite side of the world um, industry that you moved into? Like, what did you do to kind of get yourself ready to go, essentially, or even how did you make that transition, if you will? Yeah, so that is a great question. I don't know how, let's, I'll, I'll answer how I didn't do it well. Um, I didn't do it well because I didn't know what I needed to know, right? I had never worked at a startup. What I knew from my time at Goldman is you could be, right, at Goldman and any established firm, you, you get exactly what you need to do. Here are your 10 things you need to do. If you do them well, you get promoted in two years because every analyst gets promoted in two years. Uh, and it's easy for the boss to say if you're doing it well, because they they know they've been doing it for 150 years. At a startup, you need to figure it out. I got a lot of problems thrown at me um, when I asked my boss how to solve it. He's like, I don't know. That's like why I have you here uh, to solve these problems. Uh, that was a steep learning curve for me to not already have like this predefined playbook. It's also currently while I'm hiring, we're not actually hiring at the moment, but back before COVID, when we were hiring at Dig and at HelloFresh, when I would interview people from old, who had only worked at established companies, uh, one of my famous interview questions is, tell me how you can just open a blank Excel workbook and like figure something out, right? You can't just open, oh, we did this in 2015, let's go find that file. You've never done this pricing analysis. You've never done this operations problem. Like, how can I trust that you know how to do that? Because um, I had to learn it. And anyone who I hire, I prefer if they already know how to do that. Great, thank you. Great, so I have two other sections. They're not as um, focused on me as that first one was. Uh, so this, Final section, or second section is setting yourself apart from other applicants. And if you've ever heard me at any of like the talks in New York, you might have heard some of these uh, tidbits before. So apologies for the repetition. Um, so some of these are basic. I know you learn about them at school, but I just want to reiterate from an external person who interviews and hires a lot of people, uh, this is what I look for. Resume tips. No typos, obviously everybody will tell you no typos, but my biggest thing is this no formatting inconsistencies, right? If you go back, slide two, I wrote, I love attention to detail, um, right? If you have like something underlined in one section but then not underlined, that kind of drives me nuts. It's equally as important as the no typos and 
anyone with eyes would catch that stuff if they just put in the time. Uh, so print out your resume and review a hard copy. I do that. I don't have to have resume that much, but any important document I do at work, I also print it out and review. Uh, you just catch things in hard copy so much easier than on a screen. Um, this one took me a long time to figure out how to do. I, a lot of uh, my mentors had to force me to do this um, on your resume, bragging about yourself, right? So maybe you were elected to the VP of Ada Alpha Psi. Me as your interviewer, were you the only person who ran? Did you run against your whole student body? Um, so say what the goal, like put some context behind that goal, right? If, if you write elected as VP, because I just ran and I was the only one, fine, that's great. I like that you're in an exciting position. But if you say you beat out some of your peers, like, okay, you're, more, you're special, you're more special, uh, I should view you as being more special. Uh, and then show your authentic self, hobbies, interests. I assume you guys have that bullet on the bottom of your resume. Some people do, some people don't. But if you do, make it unique. Um, people always just write, they love to travel. Yeah, like we all like to travel. Um, explore, so I put an example, exploring restaurants in new cities. I recommend Fisher's Palace in Paris. I don't know, something like that. So me as a person who reads the resume, I'm actually getting something out of it. I'm not just reading, okay, you're like, you like to travel. Um, so that's my resume tips. Uh, my LinkedIn tips. When you're applying to a company, this is a big one, I need you to follow them on LinkedIn. When somebody applies to dig in and I look up their LinkedIn and they don't even follow me, me being dig in, not me being me, um, that shows that they're, they just like did a resume drop, they haven't been following it. I don't care, you can start following it and then apply. But yeah, literally, I wouldn't be able to tell. Uh, but it just shows that extra push. And also if you follow competitors. So Sweetgreen is a major competitor for Dig In. If I see you follow us and Sweetgreen, I get you, you're into the industry. Um, and I'm very much more likely to think positive of Lee. Positive of Lee, have you? Um, to connect with your classmates now. LinkedIn was not a thing when I was an undergrad, so I don't even know how I would connect with some of those people that were in my classes. Um, but you're going to want those connections later in your career, right? You go to women for two, for multiples of reasons. Creating your network is one of them. Um, so connect to people. I, as an interview, have a rule about people at a certain level in their career. So after you've been in the workforce for, call it, four or five-ish years, I expect that you have 500 connections on LinkedIn. Um, anyone who does it, to me, is kind of a red flag. Uh, so start building your network now so people like me don't judge you later. Um, and then this one I put in because I think this is important, especially given everything going on, is to create some like goals for using LinkedIn. So like I made this up each week this summer, I'm going to send three messages. Hopefully one of those would convert to a phone call. Uh, all of us who are working from home now, it's easier for us to take these types of calls, right? If I was in the office and you say, hey, can I have 15 minutes of your time? It's a bit harder for me to duck away. But if you message me and I'm working from home, like, sure, I'll go walk my dog and hop on the phone with you. Uh, so really take advantage of this like work from home situation going on right now. Um, and then networking and interview tips. Uh, so this is a big one. People by nature are egotistical, right? It's not anything bad, it's in our DNA. We like talking about ourselves, as my presentation has alluded to, uh, and that's not just a phenomenon for me, that's for everybody. Um, so how do you do that? So if you're at a networking event and you send a thank you after, right? I expect maybe I'll get some of those after this. Like, remember that I'm more likely, oh, First, send me a message. Don't just connect with me. Send me a message and send me, Molly, I liked learning about this. I found that very interesting. Uh, you'll stick in my mind more than everybody who just requests. Apologies to people who have already connected with me on LinkedIn. You obviously couldn't do that, so you haven't heard my tidbit. Um, if I've met you before, 
right? Reference that. So Molly, I saw you speak at the finance company in New York, saw your decision to join a startup was very insightful. Um, if you have heard me speak a couple, me or you know all any of us Whitman alumni, um, it's good to know that you like are now following uh, our career decisions or like uh, look forward to hearing from us. Um, and then this is a big one. I've got to assume that Whitman teaches you this as well. Um, but during an interview, remember that your interviewer wants to talk about themselves also. Um, so if you need to buy time, if they say if you have any questions, I like to have the question geared toward the interviewer. So what, Molly, why did you decide to join Dig In? How did you know this was right? What other roles are you looking for? I find that more insightful from candidates than if they just say, what's the work-life balance? Like, that, A, you should never ask that in an interview, uh, but B, I, I, it's more exciting to talk about me than it is to talk about the company overall. Um, there's a, a fun story on this third bullet that, I don't know, I might get in trouble for saying, but when I was interviewing for my internship, I had my offer from Goldman and I was interviewing at EMY. I was still unsure if I wanted to do finance or accounting. And I was talking to a senior, it's like my final interview with one of the senior people. Um, and he said, do you have any questions? And I said, well, I already have an offer from Goldman. So can you convince me why I should join, <laughs> could come, come here to EY? Um, I think everybody in my life was horrified when I told them that story, but I got the offer and I, the guy like in the moment thought it was the funniest thing that he'd heard. Uh, so if you are in a situation, obviously I could read the room at that moment and knew that him and I had been hitting it off and it was like an appropriate thing to say. I would not say that in every interview I've been in, but uh, doing a little bit of, of fun stuff, if you feel a connection to the interviewer, it can always help. However, if Allison sends out an email later telling you not to do that, then I completely understand. Um, oh, and then current events. So I, I, there's no slides, there's some more discussion. I know it's hard right now getting an internship or a job. Um, and we, as people who generally hire people, recognize that. So a couple of tips on how best to use your summer, right? You should be networking, you should be reaching out to people as I had just told you, uh, but that might not pan out. Uh, so during this time, continue to just do that, build out your network and see if there's stuff to make you, to differentiate yourself for next summer, right? So I know some course, there's like some free courses, data analytics, intro to SQL, um, even if you're doing accounting supply chain, that's still a skill set that people who hire people, it just stands out on a resume. Data is just where the future is going. Um, that will stand out next summer when you're applying like, oh, yep, I get it. I get why you were unemployed in the summer of 2020. Nobody had a job then, uh, but you took your time to further your career rather than sitting at the pool in your town. You should also do that as, as everybody should enjoy some of the summer. Um, but in those like other section of your resume, now is when you should be building that up. Also volunteering. Now, given the economy, there's a ton of ways that you could volunteer. Um, also on everything on the social side that's been going on the past couple of weeks, that will make you stand out as well. Um, so volunteering, new skill set, just doing something that shows I use my time, I made myself either a better person or I learned something during this time uh, is really just an investment for your future. And I know like, right, dig in, we're not hiring. We did a bunch of layoffs. We have a lot of furloughed employees. Um, and that's also what I'm telling those people who used to work for me who aren't working for me at the moment. Uh, and then I think, I think that's it. But definitely want to open it up to Q&A um, with the remaining time we have. Yeah. And feel free if there's anyone that wanted to unmute themselves to ask a question or, of course, put it in the group chat as well. I'll ask one, um, if that's okay. I don't want to 
sure. over stuff a student. But so Molly, not only for like your initially out of Whitman and your first job at Goldman, but in these transitions, can you talk a little bit to the students about maybe what classes, skills, experiences at Whitman that you might have leaned into a little bit more? Yeah. Ooh, that's a good one. I graduated 12 years ago. <laughs> I know. <laughs> um, or even that you funny. acquired, even that, that you acquired. About, yeah, yeah. The, the class that I think about the most is probably cost accounting, which is such a, I don't know, basic one. But to me, it's tangible accounting. It's just cost benefit analysis, which in my role is what I do all the time. And I have to describe to people running departments. Uh, it, it's the tangible side of accounting. Uh, and then I recently was talking with my team, my team at DIG about core, uh, the core curriculum and the game. I think that was software you replayed where you had the, I don't know, you had the widgets, and you have to like position them in the market. Yeah. Um, and I thought I still, I played it both in undergrad and when I was getting my master's of accounting and that also is a holistic view, right? So for a lot of the analysis I do now, it's on pricing, but where you price your product is so dependent on what competitors are doing and, cost and um, your customer's willingness to pay. Uh, so, you know, everyone's always like, just lower the price. And I'm like, no, that's not the winning strategy in that game. It's to find <laughs> that middle ground. Um, so uh, that class far stood out to me. Okay. How about like maybe capstone or t or project work? Did that help you at all in terms of those first that first entree into managing teams that you hadn't really yeah. had? Before? Um, capstone both help me work with peers who think and have different interests, but also how to think like an entrepreneur, right? Because you had to create, you had to come up with a business. Uh, there are a lot of times now at Dig where we're just figuring out new product lines and trying to make it, make it up as we go along. Um, the group project work right now, so I'm on the leadership team at DIG every day for an hour. I talk with the heads of every other department. So that's marketing, supply chain. I guess I represent accounting. What am I missing? Supply, which is separate than supply chain. Um, and it's understanding what their KPIs and goals are and what mine are and how they're aligned. Uh, so when we did capstone, it was from a bunch of different majors, right? I don't think anybody else on my group was finance and accounting. There were all the other ones. So it's what skill set do they have to add value? Um, when, what do I know and where can I add value? And where can't I add value, right? I cannot add value in a marketing function. I am not creative as you can tell by my slide deck. Um, but other people have that skill set. And that should be, they should rely on my analytical expertise to be partnered with their marketing expertise. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think I have one question. Sure. So uh, you mentioned your experience in uh, HelloFresh, which is a startup. Um, and then you said the learning curve, it's pretty steep because, you know, nobody can really help you with the problem because everybody's have their own problems <laughs> since it's so tiny. Uh, currently, I'm kind of in the same similar situation because the, the company I'm interning for, it's super tiny as well. And I would just want to know more about the learning curve that you mentioned, like what, like, how does it like, where did you go or did you ask for mentorship from like somebody else outside of the company or is there online things that you uh you used or what kind of channel that helps you to you know kind of go through this uh learning curve yeah so i first so i did both internal and external uh so internal just because nobody my boss can't help me doesn't mean my peers can't. So I had a lot of, there were about five of us that were peers, although we worked on different projects. We were just peers in the sense that we're the same like level. Uh, and there I would ask them what they thought, right? It, it wasn't their area of expertise. They weren't on the project. It wasn't up to them to have the project successful, uh, but it was like collecting thoughts. Also, 
I relied on my network. So posting on Facebook and some of the Facebook groups I'm in or LinkedIn, hey, has anybody solved this problem? Has anyone ever found a new program for people to submit their expense reports? Like I have no idea, I've never done that, but somebody out there in the world has done that. Uh, so utilizing those. And then obviously you could Google stuff, but I found being able to talk with someone live, either a coworker or an old classmate um, was much more helpful. And then being very open and honest with your boss, right? So a lot of times we iterate. Uh, so I'll give my boss something. He doesn't have, know the right or wrong answer. He couldn't even tell me what he wanted me to do in the first place. But once he sees that thing, then he can comment on it. And we kind of do this circle and be veering towards the right direction. Uh, whereas when I was at Goldman, if I handed something in and I got comments back or my boss had sent me in a new direction, I would be devastated. Uh, and that's just something at a startup, it's not a bad thing. It's everybody has an idea. We don't know where to go, but we'll figure it out as we go along and understanding that getting feedback or getting new direction, like is only helping your learning curve and is helping the company. Makes sense. Um, Thank you. Valerie, too, you can, um, a lot of towns through their chamber have networking groups that are business groups that they do meetups and things like that so that you can run some of your thoughts by other people who are in business, maybe not necessarily in your business. So I don't know, Molly, if you've ever used any of your local um, resources outside of your your own network but sometimes that's helpful because you get a different view just a thought i've done i found ways to expand my network right so now my network is within plus one mm -hmm. plus the places i've worked um but there are a lot of like startups that are create networks uh, so there's meetup there's i mean just like random facebook groups that i've been dreamers and doers is like a big one that i've just been added to over time um, and then there's another company called Lunch Club that just pairs you with one other person on their network. You used to get lunch, now you just do a virtual thing. And it's just these ways to continue to expand your network out, right? My network probably is pretty big to begin with, but these are different people that I would have not interacted with come from completely different backgrounds. And therefore, if I brought a problem to like a lunch club meeting, my, their perspective is going to be entirely different than maybe one of my old women classmates who is on a similar trajectory as I am. Gotcha, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Sure. Um, I'm wondering if there, if like you were in our shoes right now, if there's anything that you would have like done differently at Syracuse or something you wish you could have done while you were on campus? Ah. Uh, I, so the data analytics major or minor, whatever it was, didn't exist when I was there. I would, if it's offered as a minor and you're already said with your major, I would 100% pick that up. As I said, data is where the world is going and it translates to every other aspect of business. Um, two, I put that bullet on my women's slide. What did I do? I was just a really good student uh, at the time. I didn't see that networking was as important. I had since learned that. I just said how big my network was, but that wasn't my focus when I was younger. Um, I probably could have taken my head out of the books and got involved in more clubs. Uh, I ended up doing that at, when I went to Wharton. Wharton, I was on every club that existed. So I had my opportunity to correct myself. Um, but I do think that is important when you're younger. As are getting good grades, you definitely should get good grades, uh, but it's being more well-rounded. Thank you. Okay. All right, I think we're wrapping it up here. And of course, um, we had mentioned in the event, Molly, to connect with you through LinkedIn and or on Whitman Connect as well. Um, for any of the students that would like to speak further, have questions after the fact, because we know that happens sometimes as well. So 
So thank you again for your presentation today. Um, it was wonderful, lots of insightful information and super helpful for not just the students. I always learn something new every time we've do, done this as well. So uh, we appreciate you taking the time. So thank you, Molly. Yeah, no problem. As I said, message me on LinkedIn and message everybody's working from home. We all have 15 minutes to hop on the phone. Uh, so feel free to take me up on that offer. Great. All right. Thank you, Molly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.